Okay, we back again uh, for part two. Grace first Torah, friends or enemies. Uh, so we're gonna try to pick up where we left off at. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. All right. All right. Now we went through, because we're trying to show what Paul was saying, but that no man is justified by the Torah. It is uh, in the sight of Elohim. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. Because, again, the Torah alone can't do anything for you. There are instructions. If you don't follow them by showing your actions, that's the most important thing. Your actions, your actions that will be justified. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You know, but the instruction by themselves, they're just instructions. If you don't pick them up and do them, they won't help you. Now, um, we're going to look at this a little closer. So we're going to do some, some reading because this is just part two. I'm going to try to do it, and I always want to try to do it in less uh, parts as possible, but it's just so much information that I want you to get. And then uh, um, while we was, had the feast this uh, past weekend, one of the brothers brought up, brought up a good point. And I'm thinking that this is like basic stuff, but he was just uh, saying that, uh, well, he's like an airline stewardess, and um, uh, he's trying to help me spread this thing. So I'm going to start doing these 15 minute hits on certain topics and start tearing apart this uh, um, this dispensationalism because I got something I want to put up on that um, because a lot of people don't like to do a lot of history reading and you have to do that to get a full understanding of when it comes to the commandments and all, all these things, why this whole thing is twisted up. Because you have men that crept in unawares, just like the book says, and they and they did do it unawares because there's a lot of people that don't understand this. You know, you had a big separation going at first and second century. That's when a lot of this foolishness started happening. A lot of people started wanting to um, ignite their own brand um, of worship on this book. So, I mean, but we're going to get into that later, but uh, I want to do, like I said, we're going to do some reading on this one. So um, let's go to Hebrews 10 and, and uh, 38. Hebrews 10 and 38. And we're going to try to pick up where we left off at. All right. Now, Paul is telling you the same thing in the letter to the Hebrews. Now, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall not have pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, I have Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Now, this is something that just amazes me because people say that, well, I have faith. They say it all the time, but they think it's just I believe on Christ, right? But again, we're trying to show you from the very beginning that it takes action to please the most high. And this is what we have to understand, right? Because if I'm going to be righteous, just, lawful, I mean, all these words mean just, right? Or to be justified. But this 11th chapter of Hebrews, it goes basically almost through the whole book showing you what faith really is. And it's in the New Testament. That's why I just be like, I don't get it. But I do get it. So let's start at verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the words of Elohim, so that things which are seen were not made of them, of things which do appear. Now, all the way back to the beginning, verse four, by faith, Abel offered it to Elohim a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. That had nothing to do with it coming from the ground. It was just the fact that it was the first fruits or the best of the first fruits. 
by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. There's that word again. I mean, if you've been following these lessons, you ought to know by now, or using your blue letter Bible, or Strong's, if you've got the Strong's Concordance, this word righteous just means the same thing. He's being just, he's being righteous, he's being lawful, right? Obtain, um, no, I'm sorry, by faith, Abel uh, offered unto Elohim a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was his, that he was righteous, Elohim testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Why, how, what, what happened? Because when he, brother, executed him, his blood was speaking to Elohim from the ground, right? Genesis 4 and 10. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because Elohim had translated him. For before his translation, he had uh, this testimony that he pleased Yahuwah. It's all right there. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So this is what we're looking at, right? We're looking at trying to be justified. And you have to have faith. But let's keep going. For he that cometh to Elohim must believe that he is, number one, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you have to diligently seek him. It's the only way. It's the only way. Can't be lazy doing this, y'all. Got to put the time in. You have to do that. You got to put the time in. Otherwise, I mean, it's not going to be pleasing to him, right? All right. Now, let's go over here to the... Let's cross-reference Romans 12. Mm -hmm. Romans 12. Let's see. We're going to start at verse 1. Like I said, we're going to do some reading on this section right here. Romans 12 and 1. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, so I, I'm, 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 uh, I beseech you, brethren. Uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So I'm pleading with you, right? By the mercies of Elohim, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to Elohim, which is your reasonable service. Right? And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that, that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. Right? Now, other classes, we told you the Mashiach came to do the will. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be trying to find out how to do the will of the Father. And being diligent is one of the ways that you uh, are doing his will. Do, uh, diligent for what, Saul? Diligent to keep his commandments. Diligent to be righteous. Dil diligent to be just. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think so soberly. According as Elohim has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, right? Because we got different things that we're supposed to be doing, right? Now, let's jump down here. Uh, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. We're supposed to hate the evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate. Uh, one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, right? Because that word fervent, serving uh, Yahuwah. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be on the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but uh, uh, consent, con, con, condescend to men of low esteem. Be not wise in your own conceits, right? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, right? We can go back to Leviticus 19 and 18. It's going to tell us what we're supposed to do for each other. If it be possible as much as life in you, Live peaceably with all men. Dearly be loved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, right? So, 
let's go back over here to, to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. So these are some of the things that we have to do if we want to please Yahuwah, right? This is what we're looking at. Uh, now, uh, this is a couple other places we could have went, but we don't want to go too far because I'm I want to just let's keep looking at this because, like I say, people read this 11th chapter. Well, maybe they don't because again, this is telling you what they're doing by faith. This is an action word. Okay, verse seven. By faith, Noah warned, being warned of Elohim of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, right? Remember, we looked at that word heir, right? Well, it really just means betrothed, right? By faith, Abraham, when he was called, to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance to be, be to, again, to be betrothed to Yahuwah, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, but with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So they was betrothed to Yahuwah too. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is Yahuwah. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. So it just goes on and on. It's just on and on. Let's go down to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. So they looking at the Mashiach afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them. So this is what we have to do. We have to be persuaded of them, this is verse 13, and we have to embrace them. And by embracing them, that's what's going to help you be justified because you are actually doing it. Not just saying, I believe, you, I mean, or even those that say, I keep the commandments. Okay, I keep the commandments, but do you really believe it? Are you really embracing it? Then if you do, you're going to have the qualities that we just got done reading, right? And, and, and Romans. So these are the things right here. It's, if you go through this, this whole chapter right here, I mean, let's, let's jump down to verse 24. By faith, Moshe, when he, when he was come to the to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of Elohim than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And we showed you that. I hear this man was a prince of Egypt, living in luxury. He had everything he wanted, slaves, money, power, right? All the things that people sell their souls a house of time for, all the things that people chase after, right? More than they are diligent for the creator. And what did he do? He said, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of Elohim than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect until the recompense of the reward, right? It's just that simple. So I don't see how people uh, miss this. So this is what we're trying to show you. Just because you understand what the Torah is and the instruction, that's not going to save you alone. We're going to show you some more on this, and we're going to show you, you know, so give you some more examples. But Faith is being diligent for Yahuwah. Faith is praying like you're supposed to. Faith is walking in this thing, like we showed you from some of the classes we had from the very beginning. It's more than just that I, faith, I, I believe. No, it's an action word. So let's keep going. All right. So the word believe here is action is, is uh, Strong's word number 4102. Belief, respecting man's relationship to Elohim and divine things. So we know that his commandments are divine. We know that his feast days are divine, right? All these things we've been learning about. Generally with the included idea of trust and holy fervor. We just saw that word. Born of faith and join with it. So let's find out what this word fervor means. Fervor, intense and passionate feeling. So we're supposed to be intense about this thing, right? He talked with all the fervor of the new convert. Passion, intensity, keenness, right? 
This is what we're looking for. And we just got done reading Romans chapter 12, 5 through 20. Right? Well, we didn't read 5 through 20, but basically we, we read, well, before 5, we went to verse 1. But this is what I'm trying to get you guys to see. This is, this is what faith is. Exodus 19 and 22. And it says, and let the priests that draw nigh to Yahuwah Elohim sanctify themselves, lest he destroy some of them. So this, I use this one scripture because I wanted to show you how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be set apart. Because remember, we was reading in Romans chapter 12, he was talking about taking vengeance and how we're supposed to have a fervent love for each other and how we're supposed to be willing to give to other people. Right, help people at all times. These are the things, these are our reasonable service. But the only way you're going to do that is to be like the priest, sanctify, to consecrate, sanctify, prepare, dedicate, be hollow, be holy, be sanctified, be separated. And by doing these, the, the things that are, are commanded to, for us to do in the instructions, like we just had this feast day, right? We just had it this weekend. For those that didn't make it, it is what it is. But for those that came, then you understand what it is to be separate. Exodus 19 and 24, and Yahuwah Elohim said to him, go and go to sin and come up thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people force their way to come up to Yahuwah Elohim, lest the sovereign destroy some of them. Now, I did, I'm, I'm doing this because uh, I want to point something out here. All right, most people read this in, in Exodus, right? And this is when, this is after, let's go there. Let's go there and look at this. A lot of people think this is talking about Aaron, but there was no priesthood with Aaron set up yet. That's very, it's gonna be very important because I got, I got a point I'm trying to make with this, right? Um, Let's go to, let's, let's, like I said, we're going to do a little reading on this one. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. I want y'all to see something. Now, it was, this is how it was supposed to be from the very, very beginning, right? In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came, uh, they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mouth. And Moshe went up unto Elohim and Yahuwah called unto him out of the mountain saying, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself. We showed you that how by faith they went ahead and slaughtered the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, this was pleasing to Yahuwah, right? Because again, it pointed toward the Mashiach. He rescued them from the dragon and brought them out to the wilderness to meet them on the mountain, right? To go ahead and, and um, uh, marry them. That's basically what happened, right? Now, verse five, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all people for the earth is mine and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So remember, we showed you what that means when he says, speak unto the children of Israel. Uh, hear, O Israel, by now you should understand this. If you don't, you need to go back and look at the class on uh, the, uh, the name of Yahuwah, right? So the whole nation was supposed to be priests, everybody, not just men, women too, little children, they'd have been part of the priesthood, just like when Samuel was little, right? What did he do? His mother offered him to Yahuwah because of a vow, boom. You know, Yahuwah always does his part, we just don't ever do ours, so she even made him little priestly, had a little priestly uniform, so this is the whole nation, would have, this is what we would have been. And Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahuwah had commanded. So it, it's, I mean, it's like a, kind of like a, because you got to remember, this was kind of like a military too. It was a new nation getting ready to set up. So he brought this, the elders, right, which would later be called the Sanhedrin. He brought them in and he laid all these things that Yahuwah had said, because at this time, the elders would, would you know, come 
they would see what was going on because remember when he, Moshe was struggling, right? And then his father-in-law came to him and said, man, you're killing yourself. You got to set up some people that's just minded to help you with this. So when he gave it to the elders, the elders would take it and give it to um, all the people. And Moshe came and called the elders. Okay, I'm sorry, verse eight. And all the people answered together and said, all that Yahuwah have spoken, we will do. And, Ramo and Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahuwah. So this brother was running up and down this mountain, back and forth, back and forth, bring it. So it, it, like, again, this shows it's not, this is not uh, Moses' law. It's just called that because he was the intercessor. So he's running down to the elders. Look, man, tell the people this. Now, this is what this is what Yahuwah says. And the people, they, the elders running, so it says Yahuwah. If we do, and they say, no, oh, whatever he says, we going to do. Then the Aaron, then, so they would run back to Moshe and let him know that Moshe would run back up to the mountain, right? All right. So we get, if we went any further, we would see that he came down on the mountain, right? The whole Elohim, we're going to prove that to you, right? The Elohim came down on the mountain. They heard uh, Yahuwah's voice. Right, Yahuwah uh, Elohim's voice, and he went ahead and uh, laid it down, and they went ahead and got married, and there was blood, blood loss. But what I'm trying to get the reason why I put this Exodus 19 and 24, when it says, "But let not the priests," right? Even though we were supposed to be a nation of priests, a lot of people take this and they think that this was talking about Aaron, right? But it's not, and I'm going to show you who it's talking about because this is very important what we're getting ready to go through so we can understand some different things about Paul's writings. And I know sometimes this is drawn out, but for those that are really coming up here trying to understand, this is the only way you're gonna be able to get it. See right here, most would think uh, of Aaron and his sons, but there was no priesthood then. So was uh, so who was, who was it? So the thing is, we were supposed to be a nation of priests, but, and if, you, if we went a little further, you would start to see that uh, again, you get the judgments and everything that's laid down, right? And then after that, you start to see in verse 24, you start to see that um, um, about how after the wedding, they had the wedding feast, they went up, uh, uh, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and the seven elders says that they saw the Elohim and all this, right? And we're gonna get into that another time. But now they're getting ready to start setting up everything for the priesthood, right? Because Yahoo already know what was he already knew what was going to happen. But he still had Aaron and his sons in mind, but they had not been consecrated, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. So let's keep going. All right. Exodus 6, 14 through 27, right? Let's go there. Let me show you something. Exodus 6, a lot of people miss this. All right, I'm going to show you this. This is very, very important to understand. Exodus chapter 6, we're going to read verse 14 through 27. Now, uh, oh, actually, I'm going to start at verse 13. And Yahoo was speaking to Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and to, unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These be the heads of their father's houses, right? So you had heads of the father's houses, right? Um, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, Carmi, these be the families of Reuben and the sons of Simeon, right? Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad, Jakin and Zohar and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, woman. These are the families of Simeon, and these are the names of the son of Levi according to their generation Gershom, Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 130 and seven years. And even with these sons of, um, right here in verse 16, is showing you Gershon, Kohath, and, and Marari. These are, they all had different jobs later on in the priesthood, right? They all had different jobs. And we're gonna show you that when we get to that. But these, this verse, I will circle this verse because it's gonna make you really, once we get to the priesthood, you're gonna really understand what was going on. So you got, but you gotta understand who these three men are. 
and the years of the life of Levi were 130 and seven years. So what, is, what this does is all the way up to verse 27, um, and verse, 20, uh, verse 26 says, these are that Aaron and Moses and to whom Yahuwah said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies, right? These are they which spake to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are that uh, Moses and Aaron. And it came to pass on that day when Yahuwah spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, I am Yahuwah, speak thee unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. And Moses had, uh, said before Yahuwah, behold, I am of a uncircumcised lips, and shall how shall I speak to Pharaoh? So this is when he's going to make uh, Moshe, a God, right? Verse seven, chapter seven, he says, and Yahuwah said unto Moshe, see, I have made thee a Elohim to Pharaoh. And he had to do that because Pharaoh considered himself as an Elohim, but that's not what we after. I just wanted you to see, if you go through and read the rest of this chapter, you're going to see that this was the firstborn heads of the family. So this was, that's very important. So when we look at this word priest in the same, uh, um, setting, right? It's going to tell you an active uh, uh, part participle of H number 3547, literally one officiating, right, a priest, also by courtesy, an acting priest, although a layman, a chief ruler, because here he is, you see right up here, we just got done reading how all the firstborns of every tribe were made chief rulers of their of their clan or of their tribe. And these are the ones that was considered at that time before Aaron and his sons were consecrated as being the priest that was gonna be doing these sacrifices. Even though we were supposed to be a, na a nation of priests, right? This is where it all, this is where um, it, it first kind of jumped off at back here in, in chapter six. So when we get to Exodus 24 and five, it says, and he sent forth the young man, let's go there. This firstborn thing is very important. And I got a class on that I'm gonna put up here, but it's a lot of this stuff you gotta understand, all right? Because we had stopped here. So, all right, we're gonna start at verse one. Cause this is after the people said that they're gonna obey everything, all that Yahuwah said that or Elohim said we will do. Then when we come down here, he tells you about the blessings in chapter 23. We, I think we've covered that. Now watch this here. Verse 1, 24 and 1, and he said unto Moses, come up unto Yahuwah, thou Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship thee afar off. And Moshe alone shall come near Yahuwah, but they shall not come near, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahuwah and all the judgments, right? And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yahuwah has said, we would do. And Moses wrote all these words of Yahuwah. See, it, again, this is just another way that you can prove. See, it was no curses involved here. It was just judgments and the royal law, which is the Ten Commandments. And then right here, I'm going to read this again. Moses came and told the people all the words of the of Yahuwah and all the judgments. So these are all the words of Yahuwah. This is not Moses' law. And all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which Yahuwah has said, we will do. <coughs> Moses wrote all the words of Yahuwah and rose up early in the morning and built an altar into the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Um, and he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrifices with peace offerings of oxen unto Yahuwah. So as we see right here, we're going to keep going down, but you see, these are these are this young man that he's talking about. And again, I just showed you something a lot of people miss. Now, at this point right here, this is when everything is getting ready to get set up because he set it, he set up the 12 pillars, right? When you go to some weddings and everything, you see how people have these little short pillars going down the aisle, then they'll have <clears throat> like a big canopy with a bride or like where the groom is standing at with the witness, right? With the priest who is basically represents Moses. So that's, that's how this thing was set up. And then the bride comes in and then they do their vows. This is what you got to think of this right here, this verse right here as, right? Now watch this here, verse six. 
Moses took half the blood and put it in bases and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant, very important, and read it in the audience of the people. Now he's been at this time, he's been writing all this stuff. The Ten Commandments is written down in here too, right? He wrote down all the judgments, right? Everything that he promised them from verse, from chapter 20 all the way to the 23, Moshe is writing this stuff down. And he took the book of the covenant, right, which is later going to be called the book of the law. It's very important to understand before we get to Paul, because it's going to really be the same book. The only thing about it is what, what was added was, uh, again, animal sacrifice and these curses, right? The handwritten ordinances. We can get there, though. And read in the audience of the people, and they said all that Yahuwah has said we would do and be obedient. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. That's the consecration right there. That's the consummation of the wedding, basically. That's what that symbolizes, that the husband, his wife is a virgin. She's been betrothed to him. Now he goes in to her. Boom. Now they, they, they are able, in our culture, to come out, hang the sheet over the wall, or hang take come out the tent with the sheet. There's blood on it. So this is what this means. And said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh have made with you concerning all these words, right? Then went up Moses, Adab, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders, and they saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. So this is Yahuwah Elohim. This is the Almighty. This is the Holy One of Israel that they're looking at, not the Father. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hands. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, come up to me in the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. It's just that simple. So this is the whole thing put together. But what I'm trying to show you is about this firstborn, because I'm, I'm trying to give you a, a kind of step-by-step -step thing of how this thing was transferred because we got to understand this if we're going to get into Paul's right. If it's a little heavy, I'm sorry, but this is this is how I was taught, so I got to teach you the same way. If you got to go over this a couple of times, you just got to go over it a couple of times, but this firstborn is very important. This priesthood is very important, but we see that this firstborn, the heads of the families of Israel, they all was acting priests, all right? Now, let's keep going. Um, Bible dictionary, Eastern Bibles dictionary of the firstborn, right? Redemption of the firstborn, right? Firstborn redemption of from the beginning, the office of the priesthood in each family belongs to the eldest son. But when the extension, the extensive plan of sacrificial worship was introduced, we hired a company of men to be exclusively devoted to this ministry. The, trim, the primitive office of the firstborn was superseded by that of the Levites. And we're going to get to that in Numbers chapter 3, verse 11 through 13. And it was ordained that the firstborn of man and of unclean animals should henceforth be redeemed. So this was, a, this was at this time they had to do that. Because all the firstborn that came out of the matrix belonged to Yahuwah. So this is why when we start talking about the Mashiach being a firstborn from the dead. See, he was the firstborn. All this goes back to this. Like I said, we got a class on this, but I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of insight on this stuff. So when we start seeing these words, it's going to make more sense to you because this is stuff that we've never been taught before. Numbers 3, verse 40 through 41. And Yahuwah Elohim said unto Moses, number all the firstborn of the males of the children of Israel from a month old and upward and take the number of their names. And thou shalt take the Levites for me. I am Yahuwah Elohim instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of all the firstlings among the cattle of the children of Israel. Why? Because of this right here. When these people started worshiping the golden calf, at, at I mean, they went ahead and committed adultery with the golden calf, as we should kind of gave you insight way up here when we uh, in the last class. Guess who was there? The firstborn was right there in this foolishness too. So at that point, Yahoo said, "That's it." You know what I'm saying? Because I try to give y'all, uh, you know, I mean, the whole nation was supposed to be priests, but since I see y'all don't want to have faith and be obedient. 
right? Because when Moshe went up on the mountain, if you had faith, you'd have been praying, fasting, crying, praying out, or, you know, chanting to me, however you want to put it, because that's what the rest of fire ran. But it ain't nothing, but they could have just been saying holy words to the most high, right? And I say it like that because it's not no spells or nothing like that. You know, um, sometimes I like to go to the Psalms and just stay, stand outside and just just read the Psalms up to the Yahuwah. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to do that because it's just it's just a form of worship to him, his words, right? Reaffirming his words. Um, but so this is what killed the firstborn from being uh, actually doing the sacrifices anymore. Right, Exodus 32 and 30, chapters 34, verse. We're gonna look, we're gonna look at this. Yahuwah renews the covenant and adds a promise of driving out the inhabitants. So let's go here. Exodus chapter 32. Like I said, this is very important stuff. Right now it might not click to you, but it will. Exodus 32. Let's see. Because this is actually when. Uh, Exodus 32 is actually when Aaron went along with the foolishness too, right? Went right along with the foolishness and they made a feast to the golden calf. He said, these be your Elohim, this golden calf, Apis, right? Went right back to the same foolishness. And after all these things, right? Moses had to plead with, with, the, uh, with Yahuwah Elohim not to go ahead and wipe these people out, right? And then this is when vengeance was taken on the people, right? By Levi. That's what, this is what um, basically by Levi taking up swords and, and, and killing the folks that was, I guess, the really the ring, because it was a lot of people that got killed that day. That redeemed them, right? Going way back to when um, Levi, I think it was Levi and Judah that um, circumcised that whole town and then they slew them, right? Because they, at this point, Levi was considered as being cruel, right? But then he redeemed himself right here because Aaron left the people naked by doing this by, and that's what happens when we step outside of our faith in Yahuwah and we start doing things that we know we're not supposed to. You leave yourself naked. You don't have a shield. You don't have a buckler. The Ruach gonna get away from you immediately. And I know this because I've been through this before a few times. <laughs> So right now, let's. As a matter of fact, let's let's look at something right here. I want to. I want to see something because we know that Moshe was pleading with the Most High about this. Let's go to. Uh, we're still in Exodus thirty-two. Let's start at verse twenty-five. All right, Exodus thirty-two and verse thirty-five. You should be here at thirty-two already. And when Moshe saw that the people were naked. For Aaron had made them naked until their shame among their enemies. How did he do that? Because if we go back here to verse five, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast unto Yahuwah. A lot of people get this misconstrued. He's talking about this calf. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and rose up to play. Right, so then, so and then Yahuwah spoken to Moses, go down, get thee down, for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How did they corrupt themselves? Because they committed adultery with this golden calf by worshiping it. Verse twenty six. Then Moshe stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahuwah's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, thus says Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moshe and there fell of, that, of the people that day 3,000 men. For Moshe had said, consecrate yourself today to Yahuwah. This is what this is what separation is. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Even every man upon his son and upon his brothers that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And I know this kind of might seem kind of way out, but you're going to see. And we're going to tie this together. And it came to pass on the morrow, Moshe, Moshe said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto Yahuwah. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. 
Moshe returning to Yahuwah, right? Because we can see even right here how he's trying to make atonement for the people. Again, I mean, he was likened to the Mashiach in this way. And Moshe, because that's this is what this is what Yahusha came to do, right? Or some people say Yahshua. I don't no problem because it's just a another form of saying Joshua, which is Yahshua, right? Atonement for his sin, and Moses returning to Yah, uh, Yahuwah and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them Elohims of gold. Yet now, if there, if thou be will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee out of thy book, which thou hast written, right? So it just goes on. I'm just trying to show you this. But the sons of Levi, this is where they redeemed themselves. This is where they redeemed themselves with Yahweh. Let's go over here to verse chapter 34 now. Okay. And um, verse... Oh, I, I got to hit verse one, because again, I'm just be trying to give y'all a little ammunition to help people with, because they keep wanting to say this is Moses' law. We've been seeing that it's not. Verse 34, and Yahuwah said unto Moses, you thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first table, which thou breakest. But ain't what we are. I just want to shoot that to you, just in case you've never seen that before. Let's go down here to verse 10 through 11. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all the people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art see art shall see the work of Yahuwah, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare and the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. And we're going to do that with those 15-minute uh, classes that uh, the brother wanted me to come up with. And I'm going to do it, too. <laughs> we're going to break down these other altars of these uh, other Elohims, because these other altars of Elohims is in people's mind really, really bad, right? But now if you notice something, when we go back to chapter 24, you got to turn back here. Here, you see everything being set up. You see there was a wedding. You see that there was blood. You see that there was a, a covenant confirming meal here, right? But here in verse uh, chapter 34, ain't none of that. Ain't none of that. And that is very important to, to look at. So he renewed the covenant, but there was no blood or anything else involved in this, no covenant confirming meal, none of these things. And from here on, when we start going all the way up to Deuteronomy, this is when you're going to start seeing these curses. And well, again, you know, but before then, it wasn't it was none of that added, right? Now, Numbers 3 and 10, but the layman who come near me shall be put to death. Let's go look at this. All right, Yahuwah renews the covenant as a promise of driving out the inhabitants of Canaan with an added warning about adultery, verses 12 through 17 and tells them to keep his feast, not those of another Elohim, better promises added with the same law and different priesthood. So this is when Aaron took over and was supposed to be what they call better promises, but we know they failed. So the last better promise that you got was when the Mashiach came. So when Paul says built on better promises, you have to understand, we have to go back to this beginning stuff but we can dig it out. So when we start keep coming back to Paul's writings, you're going to understand. All right. All right. Let's go to Numbers now, chapter three. So when Paul starts talking about these better promises, <laughs> you got to understand what he's talking about. So again, there's nothing new under the sun. This has already been been tried. Okay. Now, Numbers chapter three. Verse 10, I'm hoping y'all following this. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on the priest's office 
and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And uh, verse 11, and Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, And I, behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of all the firstborn that openeth the matrix among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levite shall be mine, because all the firstborn are mine. For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hollered unto me all the firstborn of Israel, both man and beast, mine shall they be, I am Yahuwah. And then, then there had to be a ransom paid. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> it had to be that. And he goes into, he's breaking down these other sons. We're going to come back to this another time. But I just want you to kind of kind of understand this, right? But he says, no layman. So that means the firstborn is out. And definitely it can't be a stranger that comes and do this. And this is another thing that happened with this book. These strangers got a hold of this book and they done flipped this whole thing around and got you believing that you under grace and all these other things. You ain't got to do this no more. You ain't got to do that no more. And we're going to get to all that eventually. But it's just that these, these, these strangers got a hold of this book and they done flipped it all the way around, right? So he's saying that, that in other words, when it says layman, it basically means a stranger, anyone else, an outsider, unauthorized person, right? Cannot come and do this job anymore. This is um, the charge is going to be given to Aaron, right? So again, that's why I have beware of these scribes, because these scribes, again, these are the people, these strangers, you know, these foreign nations, right? These unauthorized people have gotten a hold of this book and did major damage to it, especially in the first century. So I want y'all to see that. So Exodus 40 and 35, and Moshe was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of Yahuwah filled the tabernacle. So boom, that was it. Even Moshe couldn't come in here anymore. Before he was all over the place talking with Yahuwah, doing all these things with Yahuwah, but guess what? Now he can't even come up in there. Only Aaron and his sons. Where before he went up into the cloud, sin changes things. So when the people sinned, they, he, he renewed the covenant, but there was no blood in this covenant, right? Enter priest's office and blood of animals to cleanse unintentional sin, but the carnal continued in lawlessness when originally oblations were for peace. So really, when you see the young man doing these sacrifices, they were just for peace or showing same way Cain and Abel, same test that they had, right? That's what it was for, to say how much I love you. But now when they did this thing with the golden calf, this changed everything. So now a priesthood office, I mean, so it had to be a direct priesthood, not the whole nation. Whole nation can't be priests no more, you know I mean? But eventually we, we're gonna get back to that. But this is why we strive so much for this faith <clears throat> and the diligence because you're trying to have a, a, a priestly mindset and you know you, you're supposed to be practicing the righteous acts so that by the time the Mashiach comes back here and all these other things the wilderness and all these other things are supposed to happen and this tribulation and all this you're going to be able to make it because if you don't have this type of faith right where you're willing to be obedient you're not going to make it but it's very important to understand this. This is, I mean, I, again, you know, it's probably some people that have been in this thing a while that ain't they'll never even seen that. But I want y'all to see it so that you can go back over it a couple of times so you understand it. And I got a class I'm going to put up here on this so you really will understand it. But again, we just trying to get the Paul's writings, right? All right. Now, Aaron was ordained and given a charge but took no oath. This is very important because as we see how the blood was not sprinkled on the people to, after the second, uh, after the, the, the covenant was renewed, none of that was there. The current co the, the covenant confirming meal, there, there was no meal. Nobody saw him, none of these things. There was no wedding. I mean, everything, the wedding already had took place. The woman was found to, uh, to be adulterous, right? And then, then we're going to show you about that law of the husband because all this stuff is very important. I know I keep sounding like a like a um, a record, but all these things are very important. So when we start getting to Paul's writings, you're going to understand what he is talking about when he's when he starts talking about these ordinances and stuff. Let's go to Philippians. 
You got to understand this type of stuff. Because without understanding this stuff, you can forget it, man. Paul writing is going to leave you in the dust. But when you understand the priesthood and what he's talking about, these handwritten ordinances, <laughs> you're going to be like, hold on, no, 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 partner. We know that's not it. Because we know what the commandments is contained with contained in now we finna learn because now we got the history of the priesthood now we finna see i told you i'm gonna tie this together for you so philippians three and nine and it says uh i'm gonna start at eight because let me see mm, uh, yeah let's start up here because we got to see this too we're gonna go over this again but anyway let's start at uh three and we're going to start at two. He says, Philippians chapter three and verse two, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. What is he talking about? We're going to find out. For we are the circumcision which worship Elohim in spirit and rejoice in Yahushua HaMashiach and have no confidence in the flesh. Believe me, I know all about that. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man think of that he hath wherewith he might trust in the flesh, he did more. Why? Because he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of the Pharisee. Very important. People read over this and miss it every time. So he's telling you he was a show enough Hebrew and he was a show enough Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, then I counted loss for the Mashiach. What is he talking about, Saul? I'm going to show you what he's talking about. He's talking about these oral laws now because they the oral laws was gained to him. That's when that's why he was out here persecuting the church because he was like, man, y'all going against the old law. Not that, not that they he told you, but he was keeping the commandments, right? The righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. The righteousness which is in the law is what? The Ten Commandments and the judgments that was given on Sinai. He was blameless. But what things were gained to me, which was the oral law, he counted as loss. This is what he had to count his loss, the oral law. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowing of, Yah of Yahushua HaMashiach, my Elohim, for whom I have suffered the loss of my sovereign of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win, win the Mashiach. And this is what the Pharisees was not willing to do and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. What law? The oral law. This is the law Paul took. See, that's what those people are. <clears throat> because there's no way he could be back here, the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, and then over here say that, you know, he counted the, uh, the law as dumb. It's talking about the oral law. We're gonna, this is why we had to go from the top of what we did from the firstborn that come on down, but we're gonna tie this thing together so you understand it. Which is of the law? But that which is through the faith of the Mashiach, because we know what this word means now, the righteousness which is of Elohim by faith, by, by believing, by obedience, right? That I may know him and the power of this, his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made uh, comfortable, co uh, conformable unto his death, right? Then down here in verse 14, he's telling you, um, that he presses toward the mark. But I just wanted to hit that real quick. Now, now we got to go over here. Let's go back to Ephesians. You don't understand this. There's a lot of stuff that we haven't been taught. And you don't get the full justice. Then these devils going to be able to trick you every time. See? So now when we come back, I just had to go back through this again. When it says, by grace you are saved, through faith that not of yourself, it is the gift of Yahuwah, right? Not of your works, lest any man should boast. Wait a minute, not of works? Okay, we're going we to get to that. I mean, I want you to circle this. For we are his workmanship created in Yahushua HaMashiach unto good works, which Elohim 
hath before ordained that we should walk in them. By now you should know what this means, right? Let's jump down and we can go into the how the Gentiles with, 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 without him and all this, because you know that's a whole nother thing. We're gonna get to that too. But let's for the me for right now, let's jump down here to verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself twain one new man, so making peace. So all he's doing right here is showing you how he was, the two that he's trying to bring back together is the Northern and the Southern tribe. This has nothing to do with no Gentiles, but they try to put it there, but it's enmity because it was always hatred between the two. Because here you had the um, uh, Northern tribe trying to come back into this thing. And then, you know, and then they would so, um, and try to relearn this thing because they had forgot everything. And they had a Greek mindset because uh, that's all they were around was all these Greeks and, you know, Ephesians, Galatians, they all spread all over the place. Then you had the, uh, the, the person that was from the house of Judah that they were still in Jerusalem and they was under the power of the Pharisees and they was basically, that's, this is where this Jewish thing comes from. We're going to show you that this is the same thing today, right? With these, uh, with these cut ordinances and these different works and these different deeds. This is what Paul is trying to say. We got to abolish this stuff so that we can make, make the, two, what the uh, both sticks come back together and be one like it's prophesied. So when we look at um, the word ordinance, it comes from the Hebrew word, uh, uh, I mean, the Greek word uh, chukua, a, a, a statute, something prescribed, custom, appointed man, a specific, specific decree. It's a law. Let's go over to he Hebrews chapter seven now. And I'm hoping I'm not losing you, but trust me, we going I had to do this because we got to get to the point where we're trying to get to um, break this thing down. But this is one of the ordinances. This is one of the um, uh, um, handwritten ordinances, right? Is is is, is a, a, again? It's because you know, people are just say, well, hey, they did away with animal sacrifice. Okay, but how? Show me what you're talking about. How, prove to me that this is one of the ordinances that Paul was talking about. They can't. Here's Romans chapter seven, verse eleven through twenty-eight. Now let's look at this thing. Very important. Now, Hebrews 11, uh, chapter 7, we're going to start at verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. See, here's a whole nother, see, this is, here it is a whole nother law. <coughs> Not the commandments. For under it, they received the law of the priesthood because Aaron was given a charge. And we know the word charge means an office, a job to do. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron, All right? So a few places we can go, but we're going to keep reading. For the priesthood being changed, we showed you how that happened, right? There is made a necessity of change also of the law. So we see now, this is like, again, we, I would, let me go back up here because I want you all to see this. Um, when it comes to the better promises, this is what this is what this is going into. Very important when you start talking about better promises, right? All right. For he of whom these things, because they already happened with the youngins, priesthood would change. Now here's a Mashiach getting ready to do it again. This is the ultimate better promise. For he of he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. What tribe? The tribe of Judah which no man gave attendance at the altar. It was impossible because, again, I told you to remember those three names I gave you of, of the Levites, right? And you're going to see what their office was. Everybody couldn't go into the sanctuary. You had some sons that handled the tents. That's all they ever did, the tents, all the little, uh, the little caps that went on the tents, the little ropes that tied the, the little, um, the little small little stakes that tied the, Tied the rope in to hold the tent up, all these things. Then you had another son, another uh, part of the Levites. They went in 
after the furniture was covered and they removed all the furniture out of the, every time they had to move. Cause I mean, that's gonna come later. We're gonna show you all this in this priesthood, but you gotta understand this. This is another thing you have to understand this priesthood when you're dealing with Paul. For it is evident that our sovereign sprang out of Judah of which the tribe of Moses spake nothing concerning a priesthood. So he didn't cause Judah was not given this office, right? And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest after the likeness of Melchizedek, who is not after, who is not made, who is made not after the law of the carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he tests, now see again, he says, who is not made after the law of a carnal commandment. Yahuwah cannot give you a carnal commandment. Whatever comes out of his mouth is just holy and good. And if you want to get in the kingdom, you got to do it. <clears throat> Hold on, excuse me for a minute. So this is what this is saying. Not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. <clears throat> so you see, once there is a covenant, it cannot be disannulled. But we can show you that Joshua added to it because he, I mean, we're going to show you this later on about adding and taking away, right? But I'm going to read that again. For verily there is a disannulling of the commandment going before the weakness and unprofitable there. Uh, thereof because this thing we see Aaron was weak right and we see that Aaron was ordained and not and given a charge but took no oath even when he even when he consecrated them the, the blood was mixed with oil it wasn't just pure blood very important for the law made nothing perfect is that talking about that now you understand is this talking about the Ten Commandments is this talking about the judgments no it's talking about this law, this animal sacrificial law. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in a better hope. Who was a better hope? The Messiah did, by the which we draw nigh to Elohim. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto them, unto him, Yahuwah swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Yahusha made a surety of a better testament. See, the word testament just means covenant. So you had the old covenant, the old testament that they don't want you to read and tell you ain't got to do no more because that's for the Jewish people. And then now we have the New Testament that is for us. All uh, that came straight from these uh, folks with this, um, with, uh, I would be just talking about, uh, 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 and I hate this word too. Hold on a minute. It'll come to me. Uh, 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 I'm not having a blockage right now. Um, this dispensationalism. That's, that's where that came from. We're going to prove that to you too. We're going to show you what the going to heaven dispensationalism. All right? We ain't got to do nothing no more. We just under great dispensationalism. We're going to prove this to you. But anyway, we, we got to keep going. But this is, I mean, this is how we break up this stuff so that those that come up here constantly, I'm telling you, you're going to be boss. Give yourself a little time with this. I promise you, you're going to be boss with this. All right? And then Yahoo are going to be smiling too. And they truly were made many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So it is, they coming and they going, they coming and they going, right? But this man, because he continued forever, have an unchangeable priesthood. We, show, we showed you how the, the priestly duties changed already one time, right? Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come into Elohim by him. This is why you got to come through him because you can't do these things on your own. <clears throat> you can't keep these commandments on your own. That's been proven. But through him, 
This is where you get the mercy until you keep practicing and practicing and practicing until you're not doing the same stupid things over and over. Uh, Brother Sao went through that too and still sometimes go through some stuff. You know what I mean? This is a fight. You got to realize that. <clears throat> so, for such an high priest became us who is holy, separated or consecrated, harmless. We just got that showing you that in Romans 12, probably one of the other characteristics you're supposed to have, undefiled, no sin. He kept all the commandments. He kept all the statutes that he was supposed to separate from sinners, like we're supposed to be, um, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifices, right? We're going to show you the weakness in a the, in the high priest, right? First of his own sins, you see what I'm saying? And then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests, which have affirmity. But the word, uh, the oath which was sent the law make of the son who was consecrated forever. So again, without going back to the beginning, they've been trying to keep you away from all that stuff. You ain't going to understand <coughs> these writings of Paul. It's impossible. <clears throat> Let's keep going now. You should understand that totally now. Uh, so you shall appoint Aaron and his sons that he may keep the, uh, keep their priesthood. We just showed you that in Numbers 3. <clears throat> Take thee, uh, thou unto uh, the Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the, in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, uh, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, Aaron's son. And thou shalt make uh, holy garments for Aaron, thy brothers for glory and for beauty. All right, Hebrews chapter seven and five. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of priesthood have a commandment to take the tithes of the people according to the law. That is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham, Hebrews seven and five. So we know that this is talking about the office of the priesthood. Exodus 28 and 41, shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, and you shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them, and they shall serve me as priests. Let's keep going. Hebrews 7, 11, if therefore perfection were to be through the priesthood of the Levi, right, or Levoye, this is out of the Septuagint, by which the law has been put upon the people. Why was there another priest required who should arise in the resemblance of Melchizedek? For he had said in the likeness of Aharon, he shall be. So this law was put upon the people. It was added upon the people, right? Add what is yet wanting in order to render a thing full, to complete, fulfill prophecy, to complete a goal. Now, when we go to Galatians chapter 3 and 9, wherefore service the law? It was added, boom, boom, because of transgression to the seed to come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels or messengers in the hand of a mediator. All that for all this, all that just for this one verse, huh? But we gotta do it this way because if you don't do it this way, you won't understand it. Let's keep rolling. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. All right? So Genesis 2 and 17, uh, Genesis 3 and 19. Let's, let me see where I'm at right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, we got a long way to go. Not really, but I tell you what, we gonna we gonna stop right here. Um, yeah, we are gonna stop right here, and then I think we can get the rest of this in the last part, maybe. I don't know, but I know that took a little while. But I'm just telling you, this the only way, and I don't want to have them too long because I don't want y'all going to sleep and all these other things. So when we come back, we are gonna start right here. We're going to come right back to right here. 
But again, now you understand that's just, I, I'm sorry again that we had to go through all that just to prove that point right there. But again, you should be better because of this now. Now you should understand one of the things that when Paul starts talking about the law, and we're going to get into that. Let me see something here. And I know that sometimes this seems like it's a lot, but I'm sorry. This is the only way y'all going to be able to understand this because there's been so much trickery and lies put to your mind. And the only way we can bust that thing up is we got to go back to the root. We got to go back to the root. Because when you go back to the root, you know, you go up to a tree and start picking the fruit. And then it's like, man, what's wrong with this fruit? It got bugs in it. It's all wilted up. I wonder what's going on? Well, we better dig around the root of this tree to find out if there's some mites or some worms. Something is on the, on the roots that's messing this up. And it's the same thing. I'm trying to make sure the fruit you're getting is fresh, is good. But the fruit we, you've been getting is garbage. But you still been eating it because you ain't know it was a better it was better fruit out there. You ain't know how to cure everything so that you can get a better crop. Well, I'm finished. We're trying to show you that around here. So again, we're going to stop right here. And then we're going to pick this thing up again in part three. And I think part three should do it. So uh, let's go ahead and exit out of here. So I'm hoping y'all got something out of this little last little section. But I mean, sometimes we got to go around the world, but we got to go around the world because, you know, people have been so dummy down with this dispensationalism. You know, I remember the first couple of sessions I was on pastors. I know, I know. But now I'm, after, I'm, I'm getting ready to attack this dispensationalism. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bust it wide open so y'all can see this thing for what it is. And then uh, like I mean, these 15 minute classes, real quick classes, I want y'all to put y'all friends and family on them. You know, because we're gonna go through and bust up a whole lot. That way, it's not like wow, this 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 is like an hour long. No, nah, the same, but 15 minutes prove exactly what is what. Now, if you after their eyes get bust open, then they'll go up there and maybe look at the class. So with that, I thank y'all as always for coming up here. And again, it was, I'm sorry. I asked the Father to forgive me because I was supposed to give him a steam. Oh, but it's three, it was three something in the morning and I try to do these before I got to get out of here. So again, giving all the steam to the Father. Father, please forgive me for that, for not acknowledging you because that's all this whole thing is about. It's about you. Forgive us for our wrongdoing. Please, Father, keep us safe. Cure us of all our ailments. Keep our mind stayed on you. Let our feet walk in your path. If we fall down, Father, please let us get up and brush ourselves off and keep moving forward. I pray that everybody came up here or ex coming up here to look at this, that this will help you. I pray, Father, that you open up the eyes and the ears so they can understand. We thank you, Father. I be here for all things. We thank you for your son, Yahamashiach. The Elohim, the Almighty, right? The strong arm. We always thank you for the Ruach HaKodesh, the loving, loving one, the caring and guider of all of us. And we thank you for all things. May your light of your face shine on everyone that comes up here. In Yahushua's name we pray. Hallelujah. All right, y'all. Shalom, shalom to the next one. And it will be soon. Get ready. Peace.